Ah, well, thank you. Um, the good thing I've read my article, my interview there. Uh, basically, I even have audio interviews I was I made with Danish people. If you get the audios, they'll be very interesting. Basically, what made me atheist is largely my upbringing. My upbringing, the way I was raised as a child, at the family in which I grew as a child, that I, I was fortunate because my father was educated, uh, an accountant, and my mother, my father died 2017 March, and uh, my mother still lives about 76 years now, 77, but my mother is a nurse, though retired now. So I grew up in um, an elitist family, a family of educated people where we had the a library at home and my father was an avid reader someone who reads a lot of books and he buys so many books so my father made me love to read and his interest was mainly poetry poetry books but also philosophical books so i read so much philosophy when i was a child uh works of uh, socrates uh, works of uh, uh, Descartes, you know, uh, those philosophers, Rousseau, you know, and some of these philosophers were basically anti-religious in one way or another. And when we could read their works, we began questioning, I would begin questioning that by the time I was 12, I had read so many books of these Western writers who were basically atheists. Eh? writers that could write with so much passion, poets that could write with so much passion, bashing religion, that I began questioning why actually I had to make a sign before I could eat my food. Actually, why I had to kneel down to pray to a God who couldn't answer me. So as a child, I began questioning. And by the time at uh, the church, the priest, as we read in that interview, gave me a beating for eating the or the communion or the hostia they call it here. Uh, it woke me up because by beating me for eating what they called the body of Christ and telling me that I was under age, forced me to think more about religion. And because my father himself was critical, was skeptical, was not so much into religion. It also made me to question, but also because also my grandfather was not going to church. My grandfather, who is the father of my mother, was not going to church. It also made me to question religion as a young boy. And basically by 12 years, 13 years, I had rejected it. I had stopped going to church. I did go even for, uh, the, uh, there, is a, there is a training all boys and girls go to in the Catholic church before they turn 15 in Uganda. So I refused to go for that training. It's called Omujiji here in our local language. So I never went there and they told me, if you don't go there to train, you won't marry. You won't marry under the Catholic church. I said, fine, I, I don't need to marry under the Catholic church. You want to become a priest? I said, that's fine. Yet my mother actually is Catholic, wanted me to be a priest, but my father was very liberal. So that's how actually I become um, a, an atheist uh, from a very tender age. I only discovered humanism when I was at university. I first became atheist. Like I didn't believe in God when I was a child. And when I was a teenager, now I was hating God. But when I went to university, I discovered humanism. Oh, that is another kind of group of people who come together and they look at people the way they are. They don't believe in a religion, but they want to promote human humanity. They want to look at human rights. That's why I was now influenced to become a human at the university. But initially I was purely an atheist. Uh, partly, yes, but what motivated me to start this organization in uh, 2007 was largely because when I was at university, um, I began to teach. Like when we were there, my mother couldn't give me um, uh, money to, for upkeep. And I love to teach. I love to share my knowledge. And I thought, oh, I think I can share my knowledge and earn a living. So, Right from the university, I was teaching in urban schools, but only in schools that are in slums, schools where the poor study. 
And these are schools which could give me a job because I was not a qualified teacher. I was just a university student. Now, because I was teaching in slums, in schools, in some areas of Kampala, I saw so many problems affecting young girls. There are incidents I remember when about, I think three girls in my teaching career died and I knew they had aborted. There is a situation where a child, I call them a child, but they're about 15, 16 years, began bleeding when I was teaching. Bleeding when I was teaching at a school called Kampala Student Center. And we took this girl out when she was bleeding and she later died. So now these experiences of girls aborting and getting problems made me to think and ask myself, what can I do to help these girls avoid getting pregnant? In fact, initially, our focus was on teenagers. So this is when I began that organization with the friends, of course, I wasn't alone. We are 12 of, of us, but I was the leader with the idea and all that. But this is when we began Halea. And basically, our target mainly was students in slum areas. We end up actually making other objectives as we moved on. But our focus was young people. How do we save their lives? How do we avoid, how do we stop them from getting pregnant? How do we save those who are pregnant, young mothers? So because of what I had seen in slum areas, that is what motivated me to start a layer, to support them, to stop them getting victimized. That's what actually motivated me. Basically, even when I can say I grew up in a middle-class family, I, my family was not poor, but because I have lived in with people who are so much poor and I've seen how government cheats us. I have seen how people join politics and actually amass wealth, get so much wealth by stealing public money. It affects me, it, it, it hurts me a lot that uh, there's no way, I, I can tell you this, you can actually put it anywhere, that um, I have a first class degree in law, personally. There's much I can be doing right now because I excelled at law school. I was the best at my, at my, with my, in my class, law school. But, and I've been given offers to live in jail work, go work with government, you know, do this and that. But in most cases, I ask myself, when I go to work in government, will I be able to speak what I speak? Will I be able to remain independent with my conscience? So because of that, I've always refused to join the public service. I've always wanted to identify with the common man and woman who is being cheated, to be a voice, to, be, to give a contribution. To me, it's more of a calling, it's something that keeps pushing me, that we need to speak about the things. For example, we are from uh, campaigns. People have been shot dead. People have been imprisoned. Others have lost their children. And others have lost their jobs because they don't agree with the ruling government. When I think about that, I say, should I be able to speak or should I be able to keep quiet? If I was part of the government, would I be able to push on these things without being fired? So to me, it's more of a calling now. It motivates me to speak up, to speak up. It's very painful because you do it at your own expense. You want to get contracts. There are so many times I've lost contracts because I have a private company personally, uh, which is doing consultancy. Uh, but there are so many times my company has lost good tenders because of my publicity, because of my vocality, you know, my being vocal, my speaking out against bad things. You know, you lose a lot, but it's more of a calling. I feel I have that passion that I need to keep on speaking, keep on engaging because people give you feedback and tell you it's because of you that I'm safe now. It's because of you that I still keep living. It's because of you that I keep doing what I'm doing. You know, that, can, that thing motivates me. It pushes me to go to radio stations. It pushes me to go to TV stations and keep on talking, keep on talking because there are people who you think you are helping to keep on living. Yeah, it has, it has affected me. As I told you, I began a school uh, which actually you can publicize now, called Palo Vocational Training College uh, in 2014, as I told you. And uh, because of the work I do, there are parents who refuse to give me students uh, saying, no, that guy is actually a promoter of immorality. Uh, when you send 
children to his school, they will be corrupted, you know? And they will reach the point of saying, okay, we are going to talk about this. We are going to clean our image, but we are going to offer bursaries, you know? You end up even giving out more to the community because you want them to appreciate you from a different perspective, you know? It affects your work. As I told you, my other company, the work I do has been affected. The law firm I work with has been affected one way or another. People associate you with a lot of bad things, which actually you are not, uh, because of the activism we do, but also because of my not being a believer. Remember I told you, I'm, me, I'm one of the few open, outright spoken atheists in Uganda. So I speak out freely. I tell people that, look, we don't need to tie ourselves on religion. We don't need to hate each other because of religion. It's okay. It's no more to be good without religion. And I can tell you it will attract hate. My book on homosexuality has attracted hate for me, as I've told you. Attack at my home, burning of my car, attack at my office, you know. It, it, it affects you know, one or another. Sometimes we feel we're not safe, but that drive to keep on going, keeps me on going because I know there are so many people I inspire, I motivate to keep on living. It keeps me going. When I used to have money, I could have, um, say, guards at home. Uh, when the situation was so bad, I no longer have guards right now. Uh, but at office, we have guards. We have uh, people who man the gate uh, when we leave. Uh, so we feel safe. And um, I can also assure you that you also take precautions somehow when we are traveling, moving around, and you are going to talk about something sensitive. You may get someone to go with two or three you know, men to be around you. I move with people sometimes. When I'm going to talk about things which are very sensitive, I don't normally move alone. Yeah, it comes with some costs, but yeah, I take precautions. Of course, I have contacts of lawyers I work with, contacts of um, friends. When I see anything suspicious, I'll call them, and I always speak where I'm going. If I'm going for an interview, I'll publicize it on, on my Facebook, for example that like I'm going to this radio station, I'm going to this TV station. But people know where I'm going, but also it protects me from harm because people will keep on asking if I'm safe or if I've reached home. You know, that's how I protect myself, basically. No, I've told you, uh, it's funny, but I've never stopped of stopping because I've told you I've rejected government jobs. I have a first class degree in law. I have a degree in economics, <laughs> but I, I've stopped all these offers because by offering me a job, a good job with government, it means I'm going to stop what I'm doing. So I've never thought of stopping. It is painful, I can tell you. There are days you reach when you even have no money to travel, to move and do your work. <laughs> but you want to keep on doing it because you inspire others to keep alive, to keep hopeful. This is what motivates me. I don't want to stop. I can also tell you, that I, I offered myself about 10 years ago to become a member of parliament. And I can tell you, I went into that campaign. I campaigned vigorously in my constituency, but I lost because my opponents were using that very thing to beat me down. When you elect him, he's a homosexual, he's a promoter of homosexuality, he's going to talk about abortions, he's going to talk about this, you know, they use that to pin you down, to beat you down, to make people hate you. But I, I can assure you, I will not stop because it's part of me, it's part of my nature. I do hope that um, uh, Uganda will, uh, we have hope. I wrote a poem, I'm a poet, uh, at the beginning of this year, telling people to remain with hope because when you lose hope, you are dead inside. So I'm hopeful that one day we shall have a good country. I'm hopeful that one day we shall end dictatorship I'm hopeful that one day all of us will have rights, equal rights, just like everyone else. That people will get out of the ghettos, people will have a good living, people will have good water, people will have um, a good health. It is, I hope for the better future. That's why I see I engage into activism, I engage into human rights defense, I engage into uh, political uh, talk shows, you know, human rights uh, talk shows, because I know that. The more we keep on talking, the more we give people hope. And yes, we shall have a better country uh, as we move forward.